Uh, open your Bible to the book of Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah is near the, uh, the end of the Old Testament. Uh, it's right after the book of Haggai, which we was at last week was the book of Haggai. Uh, Haggai and Zechariah are contemporaries. They're both there at the same time. Uh, so historically, some of the same things are happening. Um, maybe if, if we have the map and the structure, put the map back up again, please, on the screen. Um, so just kind of a little bit of review. Uh, so Jerusalem's down here. So this is Israel over here on this coast. And there's a, been a split. So there's a northern kingdom called Israel and a southern kingdom called Judah. So this is where Jerusalem is. This is where the storyline is taking place. They're rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, um, The Assyrians, which are up here, which is like, uh, like Nineveh would be, uh, uh, this is all in Iraq. This area up here is in Iraq. And so they had come over, they had defeated the northern kingdom and uh, scattered them about everywhere. And then the Babylonians defeated the Assyrians. They came up and over and they defeated the southern kingdom and they took people back to Babylonia. So Babylon is modern day Baghdad, Iraq. And so they had been 70 years in this uh, in, in captivity, okay, in exile. And so the 70 years is up and it's time for them to return. And so um, uh, Nehemiah, he's, he comes back, you know, so the stories of Nehemiah, the book of Ezra, we've already talked about that a few months ago. Uh, you have uh, the book of Esther happening. That's all in the same kind of time frame. Um, Nehemiah comes back to rebuild the walls of the city because they were all tore down. Ezra comes back. He's kind of a revivalist. He's like a preacher of their day. He was a prophet, but he was, um, he was the first guy that kind of built a wooden stage and spoke God's word and explained it from a stage. That was Ezra. Um, and then what we're having in the book of Haggai from last week's message and the book of Zechariah today, uh, the, it's, um, they are trying to encourage this next group who's come back. So um, <clears throat> Zerubbabel is coming back to rebuild the temple. He's actually the, the project manager, if you will, to rebuild the temple. That's his job, okay? And um, Joshua, he's a, a high priest, okay? So um, like if we went to Ezra, in, I think it's chapter 5. Ezra chapter 5, I want to say verse, I don't even matter where it's at. But in Ezra chapter 5, it talks about that uh, Ezra was there, Nehemiah was there, and God had sent both Zechariah and Haggai to encourage the people. Okay, that's in the book of Ezra. So all this is happening at the same time. Now, so everybody hadn't come back. A lot of people stayed back in Babylon because that's where they were raised. They'd been there 70 years, right? They, people were born in Babylon, right? And so, but the ones that are coming back, what they're finding is they're finding a lot of brokenness. They're finding a lot of emptiness. They're finding uh, it's a war zone, right? It's what's been, it was left destitute, right? Go to where the books of the Bible are, that, that slide. So the blue is the history. I know you probably can't read those, those words up there, but that's the best we can make it. So uh, Genesis down to Nehemiah, this is the history line. The blue is the history line of the Old Testament. So the last book the last historical book in the Old Testament is the book of Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah were probably written together. So Ezra, Esther, Nehemiah. Esther happened between chapter 6 and 7 of the book of Ezra. So they're all together. Then, they, whoa, looky there. A, boom, bam, there it was. And then these are these prophets, we've been, these minor prophets we've been going through uh, all summer long, right? Uh, like this is Jeremiah and Isaiah, those are what they call major prophets. Those are much longer books. We haven't looked at those at all. Um, last week was a Haggai. Today we'll be at Zechariah. And next week we'll look at Malachi. And they are all under this time, the same timeline that Nehemiah is trying to rebuild the wall. They're trying to rebuild the temple. Um, all that stuff is going on at the same time. So it's a, it's a, you just think about the chaos that would have been happening. Um, they have left a, a place of prosperity. Um, uh, they, they, they had positions, they had jobs, they had homes, they had livelihood, okay? Um, uh, how many of you are tent campers? How many of you are like, I don't, I mean, I, I'm okay. I could do that once, you know, if we have to for a canoe trip or whatever. I'd rather than never spend another night in a tent. Who's that? Okay. Think about leaving your home. Okay, 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 bear with me. We're going to do something, okay? Um, we're going to do something here. We're going to have a work project in, in this building, 
and we're going to do that project, and you go back home at night and sleep in your air-conditioned beds. Okay? That's one thing. What they're talking about is we're going to leave here. We're going to go out into some hot place, and you're not going to have anything. There are no structures for you to stay in. Uh, you're going to be in a tent. You're going to be living in temporary dwellings. Matter of fact, if you go back to last week's message, the book of Haggai, one of the things that God was upset with them about was they got discouraged about rebuilding the temple, and they started building their own homes. And he's like, you're building yourself panel homes before you finish my temple. And God was frustrated with them about that, right? They, they, they had livelihood, money coming in, now they have nothing. There's no economy in Jerusalem. There's nothing. It's a broken place. It had been destroyed by, you know, decades of war. It had been left destitute. Like even the fields, the fields hadn't been plowed in, in 70 years. And you can't just go and grow crops. You can't, you can't just go grow animals. You just can't, it just doesn't work that way. You have to, you have to do some other things to make it all happen, right? Um, it wasn't like they call, you know, Lowe's or RP or, you know, Menards or whatever and say, hey, bring me some lumber. They're going and finding trees and cutting trees. They, they don't just say, hey, bring me some stones. They don't just, they have to go cut the stones out of rock. I mean, this is a, a, a major thing and they're very, they're very discouraged. Haggai last week was more, um, he was more uh, corrective. Haggai was, um, he was calling them out on their sin. Uh, very Old Testament prophet-like. Um, the book of Zechariah is a little different. Zechariah, uh, is, it, it sounds like it's very New Testament. Uh, there's things, I don't know if I'll get to, I don't, I don't know, it's 14 chapters. I don't know if I'll read all of them to you or not, but it, it, there's, there's several things in here are very New Testament. Uh, it's going to talk about Jesus a lot. It's not going to name him by name, but it's going to talk about him, right? It's going to prophesy, like in chapter 7, no, chapter 9, it prophesies him coming in riding on the coat of a donkey, right? Um, it talks about the branch. It talks about the stone. Those are names that are used for, for um, Jesus in the New Testament. So Zechariah is more of an encourager. Uh, it's 14 chapters. Uh, there's no way I can cover it all. I'm going to read the, a little bit of the first chapter. I'm going to tell you what's in the rest of it, and then I'm going to read some of the fourth chapter, third and fourth chapter to you. That's kind of the plan for today. So let me start off in chapter 1, Zechariah chapter 1, I'll begin in verse 2. The Lord was very angry with your ancestors. So he's talking to the current people at the time, right? He's very angry with your ancestors. Uh, therefore, tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be like your ancestors whom, uh, the, uh, who, whom the earlier prophets had proclaimed. This is what the Lord Almighty says. So he's saying, listen, you're not the first prophet to say this to these people. So say to them, don't be like your ancestors who the prophets before told them things and they ignored them, right? Um, uh, turn from your evil ways and your evil practices, but they would not listen nor pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Now, I, I could do this all day. I'm not, I'll, I'll do this one time maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'll do it more than that. But we'll see. So chapter 7, verse 13. Um, and this kind of is, I'm just going to tie these together real fast. So it's, it's throughout the whole book. The book is not very linear, right? It's not like in consistent thought. It's back and forth. And it's got a bunch of crazy stuff in it. They won't make any sense at all unless you do some study. Well, chapter, thir chapter 7, verse 13 says, when I called, they did not listen. So when they called, I would not listen. He's referring back to these, your ancestors. It, it, I mean, just, I mean, we all have this idea about prayer that when we reach out to God, God just can't wait for us to call him, right? We're like, take a few minutes out of our day to pray, and we're like, God, we think God's just like, oh my gosh, Tim is God. That's not how that works. I mean, I can show you throughout Scripture. I mean, it's like, what chapter 7, verse 13? They called out to me, or I called out to them, they didn't listen. So when they did call out to me, I didn't listen. That's hard. That's what he's trying to say to his ancestors. He's saying to them, this whole, this whole theme of return to me and I'll return to you. That's throughout the book of Zechariah. It was in the book of Haggai. It'll be in the book of Malachi. Come to me. I'm, I'm trying to have a relationship with you. I'm not dysfunctional. I'm not enabling you. I need you to come to me. I need you to come to me as that I am Lord, and I will come to you. I will return to you. It's over and over again. Number one, number one in the 
uh, outline is uh, Zechariah offered encouragement for rebuilding the temple. Zechariah offered encouragement for rebuilding the temple. Now, I'll read the scripture when I get there in a second. So what's happened is Zechariah starts off with calling him to come back to God. Listen, don't be like your ancestors. Come back to God. And then he's getting ready to go into chapter 1, verse 7. I'm not going to read all these things because they're crazy. Chapter 1, verse 7, he starts a series of eight dreams. They all happen on one night. Have you ever, you know, you have those crazy dreams that when you're having them, you know they're a dream, right? And uh, like I used to have a dream that snakes were chasing me, okay? Or I had a dream that, because, you know, I play sports all the time, that I got a breakaway where it'd be a layup in basketball or in football as a pass. And I got a breakaway and I keep falling down and getting up and falling down. They're chasing me. Like, you know, weird stuff, right? One time I had a dream, uh, it was my senior year in high school, freshman, uh, the fall of my senior year in high school because it's football season. And um, I had a car, it was new to me. And um, it was a, this would be 1980. Um, and the car was a 1970, but it belonged to an uncle of mine that had died. And so I got this 1970 Le Mans, Pontiac Le Mans Sport and I was really happy about it, right? Back then, anyway, side point. <laughs> we had real cars, anyway, side point. And so, uh, I lived in Mount Zion. Mount Zion was eight miles or so from Decatur, Illinois. And, um, and in Decatur, there was a, this is a true story. This part's true. They were stealing Camaros and Corvettes, okay? And so, and Trans Ams. Camaros, Corvettes, and Trans Ams were being stolen, okay? So if you had a, a Trans Am that looked like what Burt Reynolds drove on Smokey and the Bandit, it's probably gonna get stolen. That's how that was going, right? And that was in the news. And what they were doing is they would, <clears throat> they would, um, the, the theory for the police had was they was um, stealing the car. They'd have a semi truck with, you know, with a ramp. They would drive around the corner, drive up in the semi truck, shut the doors and take off to Chicago. That was the, that was the theory. Okay. In my dream, they stole my car. <clears throat> so I go to the police in my dream. And I say to the police, hey, they stole my car. I'm sure it's the same guys, because you know. And I told them the story about, you know, because what they're doing. He, and they're like saying, dude. Okay, so a Pontiac Le Mans Sport, uh, for those who have any idea what those are, uh, it'd be like a Chevy Malibu, except it's a Pontiac version of a Chevy Malibu, or a Chevelle, okay? It's that kind of car, except it's a Pontiac version. Same thing. In my mind, that's like, you know, I, 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 you know, I got this really nice car, but it's kind of a knockoff, if you, if you will, right? And it's not a Camaro and it's not a Trans Am and it's not a Corvette. Okay, so the cops were kind of making fun of me. This is my dream. I'm offended in my dream. And so I say, well, what do you want me to do about that? And the police officer says, <clears throat> and I can see his face. And the police officer says to me, well, <clears throat> what you need to do is, if I was you, I would call the junkyards. Well, I am really offended now. Like, what do you mean, call the junkyards? Anyway, so I do. I call the junkyards. I call a junkyard that is eight miles exactly from my house. It was the nearest one to my house. And he says, yes, I have, we have that. That came in. And I say, well, can I come pick it up? And yes, okay. So I walk, because I need to drive my car home, right? I walk the eight miles. I've driven this road thousands of times. So you know, you, you see all the trees, you know where the barking dogs are. I feel the, back in the olden days, when we walked and our shoes weren't quite as good, you could feel the heat of the pavement coming through your shoes sometimes. Everybody remember those days, right? Those kids are going, what? You're kidding me. Yes, it's true. And I, hear, I felt the heat of the pavement coming through my shoes. I saw the bubble gum that somebody had thrown out the windows on the ground, dead bugs, dead animals. You know, I saw a possum and a raccoon or two. Okay, this is all that real to me. All right. Okay, so I get there. I'm with my car. I'm so excited. Well, there's this line of 20 cars stacked up. They've all been smashed. My car is number 20. Down here at the bottom. And so the guy says to me, well, I'll give it to you, but they're smashed 
and they're in the right order. They got to be back in this order and they're smashed just perfectly. Like they can't be smashed anymore. So what's going to happen is he has this, <laughs> I, I know it's a dream. There were no drugs or alcohol involved either. Just <laughs> make sure everybody understands. It's a dream. He has this crane with a big magnet, great big circular magnet. I probably saw it on a TV show someplace, like, you know, back in the day, what, Starsky and Hutch or something. Anyway, he picked up the top car. And he says, if I'll help him restack the cars, we can do this. I said, okay. He picks up the top car, so it's 20 high. Okay, he drops it. Because for whatever reason, they couldn't lay it on the ground. I don't know. I have to catch it. <laughs> Okay, as impossible as that sounds, that wasn't the problem. The problem is number 19, the car around right top of my car, I had to catch and throw back up on top. Okay, we're not done. We pull the car out of the way because they have to be stacked exactly in that location. So I restack them all. Exactly, we went through the same experiment over again, did it one more time, and so I got them all back in order. So, for, I know, amazingly, the wheels on my car were fine. My car smashed, like you'd picture, the wheels looked fine, and I said, well, how am I supposed to, I can't get in that, how am I supposed to drive that home? He says, well, I'll give you a chain and you can just carry it home. <laughs> Drag it home, I said, okay. Well, he gives me a log chain. Well, it's like the ones you see like on ships in the movies, you know, like where the links are like this big, right? Okay. And I'm like, okay. So he says, I'll even get down here. But I, don't, I have no idea how he got it under the frame of my car, but he did, right? In my dream. And he got under the frame of my car. He, so I pick up this chain. It's got these big links. Okay. And I'm going to drag this dude home. I am walking my car home. Okay. Uh, the next morning was Sunday morning. So how Sunday morning rolled in my house was uh, I slept and I stayed in bed as long as I could. Mom would come to the bottom of the stairway and she would yell, Tim, time to get up. We all knew that it was not me I was going to get up. That's like, that's like the alarm before the snooze. You know what I'm saying? We didn't have snooze alarms back then, but I'm going to hit that thing for nine more minutes. Is that kind of a deal, right? Mom yells. I hear her. Then she yells again. That means, okay, well, I'm not kidding you. Like, it's time to get up and go. I try to get up and go. I, I can't go. Like, I can't move. She comes, and the next thing is she comes knocks on the door. If she doesn't get the correct response when she knocks on the door, she's coming through the door. Okay? Mama comes through the door. I'm laying in the floor. I can't move. I try to get up. I just fell down. My, my bed... Uh, I had sweated so bad, like I had uh, salt rings in my bed. Like it was a dark color, it was a dark blue sheet. And it's okay. Now, I'm telling you the whole story to say this. I get sick. I have a 104 degree temperature. We take me to the emergency room, blah, 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 blah. I wasn't sick, sick. Like I didn't have a flu or something, right? But all they could come up with, the doctor said, all those things he just told you are impossible. We all know that's true. But in his dream, he was really doing those things. Like he's really catching the car. He's really going through all these things that was happening to him. And my body was responding to all of that. It left me sick. Okay, now, what happens in the book of Zechariah is on one night, he's going to have eight dreams. Crazy dreams. I mean, there's horns, there's, there's, there's horsemen, there's, there's, there's all kinds of crazy stuff happening in these dreams. And they're all like eight dreams, back to back to back, all in one night, which had to be just you know, horrifying, because some of them were terrifying. Like, there's one about a woman in a basket, and anyway, side point. They're, they're crazy, okay? He goes through those. Now, the third dream and the fourth dream aren't so bad, and you might be familiar with a little bit with some of the scripture out of the fourth dream. In the third dream, he's talking specifically to Joshua. So, God is speaking to J Zechariah in a dream about Joshua, Okay, Joshua was the high priest who had come back with Zechariah to rebuild the temple, okay, and restore the customs of the temple. So let me just kind of read a little bit of chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. That sounds very New Testament-like, doesn't it? 
That's what the end times is going to happen like at the, at the final judgment day. <clears throat> the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? In words, he was destined for hell, and I have snatched him out of that. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel, and the angel said to those who were standing before him, "Take off his filthy clothes." And, the Lord, and he said to Joshua, "See, I have taken off your, I have taken away your sin, and I will put on fine garments on you." That's very New Testament, isn't it? So what's happening in the dream is that Joshua is not, he's not really there. It's a dream, right? And what Zechariah is seeing in this dream is that Joshua is wearing the filthy clothes of the people. Okay? And, um, and, and Satan is accusing him. You know, the Bible, the New Testament calls him the, the accuser of the brethren. Okay, Satan's the one who says they did all these things. Here's all their sin. Here's how bad they are. Here's all the mistakes and choices they've made. And then what it says is, in the New Testament, how it talks about it is that God sent this man named Jesus down the cross to take the sin of all mankind. And God gives us, the phrase is, his own robe of righteousness. That God takes off our filthy rags and exchanges them for this robe of righteousness. That's exactly what he's talking about right here. That Joshua stands there representing all the people. And God says, I'm taking off your filthy clothes that represent your ancestors and the sin of your people. And I'm going to place upon you this new garment. They don't call it the robe of righteousness, but that's just the way that the New Testament refers to it. Put on this new, this new robe of, of uh, this new garments of, that are clean, right? Um, it goes on, he says in verse uh, 6, And the angel of the Lord gave a charge to Joshua. Again, it's in a dream. Joshua's not here. The angel's not talking to Joshua, but in the dream this is happening, and Zechariah is supposed to explain this to Joshua. Um, the angel of the Lord gave his charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If, if you walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, you will govern my house and have charge in my courts, and I will give you place among these standing here. Verse 8, listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates see before you, you are men, and here we are, symbolic of things to come. I am going to bring my servant the branch. My servant the branch. Who's my servant the branch? Well, you, you know, if you, in New Testament language, that's Jesus. He's, he's, he's talking about Jesus right here. This is Zechariah, 500 years before the birth of Jesus, talking about Jesus. Um, verse 9, see the stone I have set in front of jo The stone, in the New Testament, is called the cornerstone. Right? He's talking about Jesus 500 years before Jesus is born. All right, go with me to chapter 4. This is another one of the more tame uh, dreams. Um, some of them are actually pretty terrifying. And what he's trying to do, let me back up. <clears throat> he starts off chapter 1 with, Return to God and God will return to you. Now he's going to bed that night. He's going to sleep. God's going to give him eight dreams. Out of these eight dreams, he is going, and the book is just, like I said, it's not linear. It's weird. It, it, it jumps back and forth and talks about all kinds of stuff. But it's going to, and some of it's prophecy and some of it's actually happening in real, life, in, in real time. But the idea is God is trying to use Zechariah to encourage the people to finish the work of the temple. They are discouraged. Okay. Um, it's not just to finish the work. He wants to repopulate Jerusalem as well. So and you think about it like this. Um, we get all excited. We're going to leave our homes and our jobs and everything. And we're going to go away to this other place. And it's not a very hospitable place. And we don't have, you can't just go to the store and get your groceries. And the food's just not growing in the fields. And it, we're living in tents. And it's not very fun. And we got there. And it was great. But now we don't have enough help. And the people, they're all staying back home where they're in the nice homes and air conditioning, have their jobs, and they have their money, and they have their food, and that's what they're doing, and we're over here by ourselves suffering. That's kind of the mindset they were in. They were just really not in a good place. All right. And so he's, he, some of the things he's going to say are kind of scary. They're terrifying. Like the imagery is like, what in the world is that? But when he would explain it to them in real time, he was trying to use those things to encourage them. 
Uh, here's another example, chapter 4, verse 1. The angel uh, who talked to me returned and woke me up uh, like someone being awakened from his sleep. Uh, he was awakened from his sleep. But it, he's, just, he's still in his dream. Like, have, you ever, have you ever had a dream where you thought you was at work? Like you was doing your normal task of your job? You know, it's, it, this is like one of those kind of dreams. Like he, he's being woken up in his dream, but he's still asleep in a dream. Right. What do you see? I answered, I see a golden lamp stand and a bowl on top with seven lamps on it with, a, with a seven channels uh, to the lamps uh, so that there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and one on the left. I asked the angel um, who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And he answered, do you not know what these are? It's like, well, do you not understand what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, verse 6, this is the word of the Lord to the Zerubbabel. So now chapter 3 was, was a message that, he wanted, that God wanted him to give to Joshua. This is a message he wants him to give to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel rebuilding the temple. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now that's again, if you know anything, if you know any quotes out of the book of Zechariah, that might be one you would know. That, that, that verse is quoted a lot um, in various ways. And it, it sounds very New Testament-like. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Now, again, in this day, the Holy Spirit didn't live inside of people. He lived on the outside, right? The Holy Spirit was active in Genesis chapter 1. The Holy Spirit was there, right? He's throughout Scripture, right? But he didn't live inside of people. But it's the same kind of concept. What he's saying is, is not by uh, human effort. So, again, you're, Zachar, uh, you're Zerubbabel. You're overwhelmed at the size of the project, you're overwhelmed at where you're going to get all the supplies from. You have no idea how in the world you're going to get this job done. There's not enough money. There's not enough supplies. There's not enough people. They're discouraged. You're discouraged. You're trying to encourage them, but you're discouraged. It's hard to encourage them when you're the one discouraged. It's just a really bad time. And God sent the message to Drew saying, listen, it's not by your might and it's not by your power, but it's by the Spirit of God. It's not by your capabilities it's not by your ingenuity. It's not by your manpower. It's not by your finances. That God wants to do the kind of thing that only God can do by his spirit. Okay. Verse 7. What are you, mighty mountain? Before is a rubble, you'll become level ground. Then uh, he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. Now, what he's saying is, is that this mountain of a project... Like it's overwhelming. I mean, if you have all the money in the world, it's like I can just get it done because I have enough money. If you have lots and lots of people, I can just get it done because I have lots of people, right? He's talking to Drew, he's saying, you don't have the people, you don't have the money. How are you going to get this done? And then his answer is, this big project, this monster, mountainous project is going to become like level ground before you. Um, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent uh, me to you. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. Now, in the outline that number one I will give you, um, Zechariah is trying to offer them encouragement for the rebuilding of the temple. Um. They were a people who had a lot of rituals. And uh, they had been going through the rituals, and the rituals leave you empty. Going through the motions is the word we would use rather than rituals. They, but they had all these rituals. And they, they'd go through the motions, they'd do the stuff, it left them empty. And he's trying to, it sounds very New Testament, but he's saying, listen, you can't do this on your own. It's not because of your power, might, money, resources, capabilities. It's not going to be an act of human endeavor, but it's going to be because of the Spirit of God that this event happens. Now, in the moment that this is happening, they had been, uh, they had been stalled for like 14 years. There was a window of time that they, was do they were working, and then the kings changed, and they wanted the money for, for, to have more wars rather than to, to, do the, to have the money for the building of the temple. And so the, 
the parliament or whatever they were called their government system back then in, in Babylon, they, they pulled that money. And so they lost money. Uh, they had people who were, didn't want to rebuild the temple at all because they weren't Jewish anyway. They, are, they lived there, but they were inhabitants of the land and they didn't want it to happen. And so there had been like a 14 year window of time where nothing had happened. And so when he says, you lay the foundation, you're also going to finish the work. It's like, that was a big deal. It's like, you, you didn't just start this. You're going to finish what is going to happen. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Sometimes we, we, um, we tend to, what's it, how's the phrase? We tend to overestimate what we, what we can get done in a short period of time. We tend to underestimate what we can get done over a long period of time. Just a little bit. Over and over and over. Number two in the outline, looking at the struggle and chaos leads to a defeatist attitude. Looking at the struggle and the chaos leads to a defeatist attitude. Um, this principle applies a lot of places, but what we look at affects us. Um, we see something and then it, it, we, we start having thoughts of I can or I can't. This will or this won't. We can or we can't. And if what you're looking at is the struggle and the chaos, you're like, oh, this, everything's falling apart. Okay, we'll never overcome this. We'll never be, be able to do this. You know, in their case, we can't get, the, the trees are this many miles away. The, the stones are this many miles away. We, we, how are we even going to get them over here to us? Or whatever they were thinking about at the time. We don't have enough people. We're miserable. This is horrible. We can't overcome this. And he doesn't use the phrase defeatist attitude, but what he's, that's what he's talking about is that they're looking at the struggle and they're getting defeated. And he's trying to explain to them, God's bigger than this. It's not based on you and your limitations. It's based on God and his spirit. This is the work of God rebuilding his temple. He just wants to do it through you. That's really what he's saying. And the same thing is true for us. It's, it's, we get so caught up what we're trying to do for God. God's not really asking us to do things for him as much as he's asking us to submit to him and let him do what he wants to do in us and through us for himself. That's more how it works. Number three in the outline, <clears throat> a defeatist attitude undermines the work of God. A defeatist attitude undermines the work of God. Now, if I, I could use a lot of New Testament scriptures. I think I have one in your outline uh, under number one I do, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, but there's lots. that basically say that we are now the temple of God. So this is a building, right? Um, that's not what they were building. They were building a building that was the temple of God where God's presence was going to dwell, okay? That's, that's what they were building. That there was a spot in the temple called the Holy of Holies where there was a curtain. And on the back side of that, that's where the Spirit of God indwelt. That was, that was what they were talking about. That's not what we're talking about. In New Testament terms, the Holy Spirit does not dwell in the back side of a curtain in somebody's building. The Holy Spirit lives in a person. The moment a person places their faith in Jesus. And this, that's really the, that's the issue. That's the moment, right? Not when I believe in my head that Jesus Christ is Lord or that I believe in my head that he raised from the dead, or I believe in my head that the Bible's true, or I believe in my head that going to church is a good idea. That's not what salvation is. Salvation is not when I'm afraid to go to hell. Salvation is when I believe in my heart, the center of my being, that Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he is. And he's Lord. That he raised from the dead for the forgiveness of my sin. And they down a cross so I could be acquitted of my sin. That the moment I place my faith in him as my rescuer, as the only path I have to salvation. My good works will not save me. If I'm thinking, well, I want to go to church, I believe in Jesus, but my good works are part of salvation, then you don't understand salvation. Good works are not a part of salvation. Absolute surrender is a part of salvation. Repentance of sin is a part of salvation. The good works are the things that God wants to do in you and through you for his purposes, but it doesn't save you. The case here is, is that we are the temple of God. So let's just kind of talk about these three, and I'll, I'll close this last one in a minute, but let's talk about these three together. Zerubbabel's trying to rebuild a temple, a physical structure. 
they're discouraged. Zechariah and Haggai and the likes are trying to speak into them encouragement. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. If you'll just do what I ask you to do, I'll do these things on your behalf. If you live this way, I'll bless you. If you don't live this way, I won't bless you. That kind of stuff. Over and over again in the passages. What is it God's trying to build in you? What is it? I mean, because you're the temple now. You are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. He indwells a person. What is it God's trying to build in you? I mean, don't get, it's not, you have to be weird about it, right? You don't have to be like something great and grandiose. Maybe he just wants you to be kinder. Maybe he's just working in you to forgive. Maybe he's just working in you to take some kind of next step of obedience. To follow through with something that you need to follow through with. Maybe, maybe he's encouraging you just to, I mean, you could, hundreds of things you can throw in there, right? But you're the temple. He's trying to build you. What is it God's trying to build you? I, I don't want to have a bunch of dreams about you, right? <laughs> I don't want to have, hey, I had eight dreams last night. Let me tell you what they were, and here's your name, and whatever. But that's what happened with Zachariah. I, I want to be able to encourage you and say, whatever it is that God is doing in you, he wants to complete the work in you. That don't get caught up in the small beginning stuff. Don't despise, he said there, don't despise the day of small beginnings. Well, I'm just nobody. How could God ever use me? I don't have anything. That's not your call. It's not my call. We don't know what God's going to do. But God does. I mean, I've told that story, you know, for, you know, like Billy Graham's story, you know, Billy Graham's, you know, great evangelist, all kind of stuff, right? And millions and millions of people came to Christ because of Billy Graham. But he was a teenager, a 15-year-old teenager, who got invited to church service. And he got saved, I mean, short version, got saved. What happened if they hadn't invited him to church service? What would have happened? I don't know. But somebody invited him. Think about the kids down our hallway. Who are the kids in our hallway? Some of them are well-behaved. Some of them not so much. Some of them got, you know, some of them sat there quietly. Some of them talked the entire time. Some of them played by themselves. Some of them, you cannot leave them alone for a second. All right? There are kids down the hallway. Some of them are smart in school stuff. Some of them are more mechanical. Some of them are athletic. Some of them are musical. Some of them aren't athletic or musical. There's all kinds of individual kids down our hallway. We have no idea what they're going to grow up to be. We have no idea what may happen if we just stay faithful. See, it's easy for us to look at the world around us and get defeated. Why well, try? It's dumb anyway. Politics is stupid. Don't you want to, you don't have to raise your hands, don't you want to just kind of build really tall walls around your property and stay there? You know? Don't you want to just like avoid the negativity? Whatever the word is. You don't know all the facts anyway, right? It's really frustrating. Aren't you terrified for your kids and what life's going to be for them? Because you know how it's changed in your years. You're thinking, Lord, what's it going to be like for my kids or my grandkids? Or how much worse is it going to get? I'll get into this a little bit more here in a minute as a point, but Zechariah Zechariah talks about the first coming of Jesus in chapter like 9, 10, 11. But then in chapter like 12, 13, 14, he talks about the second coming of Christ. 
And again, crazy imagery doesn't make any sense really. You know, you, you got a sign thing, like, you know, what's that really mean and what's that represent and whatever. But he, he's trying to encourage those people and he's trying to say this to them. Listen, you're looking at this project and you're getting overwhelmed. You're getting defeated. I want to remind you, and he's telling them like a problem because this, the first coming of Christ hadn't happened yet. So like in chapter 7 when he talks about this, or chapter 9, chapter 9 when he talks about this, this uh, your king is coming. He says, oh, Jerusalem, your king is coming. He's coming humble and lowly riding on the donkey, uh, the colt of a donkey. He's talking about the birth of Jesus. He's talking about the, uh, Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Okay, he's talking about all those things. But that's 500 years later. That's not next week. But he's trying to say to them, listen, you know this is happening. This is going to happen. It's prophecy. Now, in our case, it has, that has happened. We have historical evidence that that has happened. Right? Jewish people haven't, don't believe that yet. I mean, Orthodox Jewish people, the Jewish people as a culture, do not believe that yet. They're still waiting for the Messiah's first appearance. Right? The second, those last three chapters in Zechariah, he's talking about the second coming of Christ. When Christ is going to return and he's going to reign in Jerusalem and a thousand years of peace and all that kind of stuff, right? He's calling out for that and saying, this is still going to happen. So those last five or six chapters, that's just crazy stuff to these people. But he's trying to encourage them. Here's what I can say to you. We've seen the first of those prophecies happen. We've seen the first coming of Jesus. There's still the prophecies in Zechariah and other places of the second coming of Christ and what it's going to be like when he comes. I don't know what that's going to be, but it's going to happen. Just like all the other prophecies have come true. Just like we go back a few weeks ago or, you know, months ago, really, when I talked about how, you know, he called King Cyrus as the king of Persia, you know, 147 years and ahead of time and all those other kind of things, right? That those prophecies, if God says it's going to happen. When we get discouraged, what it is, we're looking at a moment we're like, we're like Zerubbabel and his, and his people. We're trying to rebuild the temple. And in this moment, we don't have enough people, and we don't have enough money, and we don't have enough resources. We don't have enough, right? We aren't enough. We aren't good enough. It's all bad that the, the, what stands against this mountain that stands against us is overwhelming to us and it's, it's defeated us and we are discouraged and we are tired and every time we turn on the radio or turn on the TV or all the news we get to listen to is, the encouragement is that's just a moment. And God's still God and he's still on a throne. He's still sovereign over the nations. And there's a day coming when he will return. We're not living for a moment. We're living in a waiting of his return. That it's not by our might. It's not by our power. It's not by our abilities. It's not by our ingenuity. It's not by our money. But it's by the Spirit of the Lord that he wants to carry out his work in rebuilding his temple. Me and you and carrying out his mission through his temple. See, in their culture, there was the building, and everybody came to the building. Now we are the temple, and we scatter. You don't come to the building just to get something from God. That he indwells you. And as we go, he wants to use us to be his hands and his feet, to, to speak, to reflect Jesus well. I don't know what has to use discourage, but it's in this moment. It is in this moment. Right now, the moment is discouraging. I don't know what has you overwhelmed, but it's in the moment. This moment right now is overwhelming. I don't know what you're all worried about, but in this moment, it's worrisome. But that's not Jesus. He's A, coming again. I mean, we can talk about that. I know in our minds, like, well, yeah, that's so far away. But in the moment, I'm really discouraged. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Don't despise the day when you think you're whipped. Don't despise the day when you think you can't have any else to give. Don't despise the day when you don't have enough and you're not enough. The trust of the Spirit of God who indwells you is enough. That he will lead you through whatever it is you need to be led through. That he'll provide for you. He'll protect you. He'll be exactly who God has called him to be. 
in that moment in your life. See, we tend to we tend to shift gears, and all of a sudden we're looking at the things that discourage us rather than the one who wants to encourage us. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about Jesus, right? You, you don't need me. you got the Spirit of God indwelling you. My job is to remind you about that some days. Number four, and I'll tie these together. Number four, we should rise above the struggle and the chaos to find hope in the coming kingdom of God. We should rise above the struggle and the chaos to find hope in the coming kingdom of God. So verses, uh, chapters 9 and 11 talk about the first coming of Christ. Chapters 12 to 14 talk about the second coming of Christ. In both of those he's using, he's saying, this struggle is not forever. Because that's one of the questions. Well, is this going on forever? Is it always going to be this way? And the answer is, no, it's not. There's a, there's a Savior coming. That your sin is going to be hung on a cross. That's those, those the chapters uh, 9, 10, 11. Your, your sins will be hung on a cross. He's going to come. He's going to come riding on a donkey. And it goes on the imagery of that. Chapter 11 is like, he's going to come as a shepherd. He's going to come as a shepherd of his people, and he's going to be rejected by the other shepherds of the people, like the religious leaders. That's all. He, he, all that is laid out in chapters, chapter 11, I think it is, but chapter 9, 10, 11. He's going to be rejected. He was rejected, right? He was rejected by the very people that Zechariah said. He's rejected by the religious leaders. He's hung on a cross. But chapter 12, 13, 14, he's not coming back next time as a shepherd. He's not coming back next time on a donkey, and it says even the colt of a donkey. He's not coming back now. I'm humble, riding the colt of a donkey. He's coming back next time as a warrior king, riding a white horse, who would demonstrate his sovereignty over the nations. They'll reign for a thousand years out of Jerusalem. Let be peace. And on and on it goes. Now to them, the culture they lived in. I mean, it didn't really change. Uh, next week, we got Malachi. And then there's a 400-year window of time where nothing happened. There's no, I mean, there was history happening, but there was no prophet speaking because God just kept stopped speaking. You're not listening to me anyway. He's going to wait until Jesus returns. Or Jesus came. And Jesus was born. He lived, and 33 years later, he's died he's on a cross for the sin of mankind. Now, what that does today is this. Is I'm going to talk about the kingdom of God in three ways. There's the kingdom of God coming is in the first coming of Christ. That's true. That's already happened. There's a kingdom of God coming is in the second coming of Christ. Then that is going to happen in the future. And then there's the kingdom of God, God's way of doing things that can happen any moment that you and I give our lives to Jesus. Because one of the other things that's in that, throughout this book is that God will do these kind of things if you'll be the people who prepare the way for him to come. And the question is, will we be the people who will prepare the way for God? How's that happen? It's about our hearts being right. It's about us recognizing that the Spirit of God indwells. He's not out there somewhere. He's here now, right? It's about us choosing to allow his Spirit to change us from the inside out. It's us being the kind of people he wants to spend time with. When we pray, does he listen to us? Do we have his ear? Are we like Abraham, who's known to be a friend of God? Or are we kind of like the people that he's talking about here? It's like, well, they, I reached out to them, I spoke to them, they didn't listen to me, so when they reached out to me, I didn't listen to them. I, the mountain you're facing, the frustrations you're facing, the discouragement you're facing, it may not go away. But in the middle of all of that, if you know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, his spirit indwells you, he wants to do the kind of things that only he can do in your life in the middle of that moment. Don't be discouraged by what you see. Be encouraged by what you believe. Politics are only uglier. You know that, right? You'll probably hear me say this a lot over the fall. It's going to get ugly this fall. 
it's going to get uglier for the next two years after that. Right? No matter what side you want to land on, it's going to get ugly. It's, Satan is like a magician. They do magic tricks and they, they distract you. They get you looking in one place while they're doing something else with the other hand, right? And I don't care what we're talking about. Politics, the next virus comes through, if anything, we're called to be a church. I don't mean the gathering of the building, I mean the people of God. We're called to reflect Jesus. We're called to point people to the only place they can find hope at the end of the day. Because all those other things will defeat us, will discourage us, will leave us without hope. I want you to be prepared. It's not by might and by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. God's in charge of the nations. He's not intimidated by whoever's in power. He's always been in charge. He's always going to be in charge. I don't know when he's going to return. I'm never going to try to hype you up on those kind of things. What I'm going to tell you is he's going to return. And between now and then, it's probably going to get darker. It's going to get uglier. But the darker it gets, is the brighter light shines. In this room, you light a match. Nobody really notices because there's, there's plenty of light. You turn out all the lights in this room, and it's black, 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 dark. Somebody lights a match, everybody sees it. Those of us who are followers of Jesus have an opportunity to shine in the darkness like never before. And some of the generations ahead, behind, uh, before us, when just people were nice people, there's good character, and there's bad things that happen, you know, but even people didn't go to church. Tell, well, thought, telling the truth was kind of important, right? We live in a world where you don't know who you trust. There's so much ugly, there's so much negativity. I want to remind you that your hope is not in anyone or anything. It's in Jesus. Place your hope in him. If you've never, if you've never trusted him with your, with, your, with your entire life, today would be a great day. Just even while we're worse, we're going to sing our four songs. We're going to have a baptism between song three and, two, and four. Just place your faith in him. Choose to just verbalize and say, I, today is an act of my wills, an act of my faith. I choose to believe that you are my rescuer, that you're the one who saves me that you hung on a cross to become my sin so I could have a relationship with God that leads to eternal life. Let's pray. You know, Father, um, the world we live in is, uh, is not what it used to be. And God, we anticipated getting darker and uglier and God, what we need is Jesus. What we need is men and women and students and kids willing to be a good reflection of Jesus where we go, to speak truth and love, to be gentle, to be kind. God, like Zechariah, we're not trying to rebuild a temple. But God, we want to see your kingdom come here. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.